Hello and welcome to The Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Doc Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. I have an awesome guest with me on today's episode, Mr. David Harris. Many of you may know David, but for those who don't, he is the CEO of Prosperident, the world's largest firm investigating financial crimes committed against dentists. He's a licensed private investigator, a forensic CPA, and a certified fraud examiner. He's also the author of two books on embezzlement. The most recent is titled Healers vs. Stealers, How to Outsmart the Thief in Your Dental Practice. And that was just released this past August. I'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes for this episode. In addition, David is a frequent presenter at regional, national, and international dental conferences and is one of just a handful of non-clinicians to be honored with fellowship in the International Academy of Dental Facial Aesthetics. Before we begin... I want to be clear that this episode is for general information purposes only, and we are not offering specific legal or accounting advice. Rather, we're merely providing general examples in an effort to help educate docs regarding the risks of embezzlement and how to handle it if you suspect you may be a victim. Please consult an attorney and or accountant for questions regarding your specific situation. In addition, David will not be talking about specific methodologies regarding how embezzlers function, as that could clearly have unintended consequences. So with that, I would like to welcome David to the podcast. Welcome, David. Thank you, Michael. Great to be with you. So excited to have you. I'm I'm really looking forward to this. Um, True story. This morning, I had an appointment with the ophthalmologist and uh, it was telling him, um, he was asking, he knows about the podcast. And so I was just telling him about it. And I said, oh, I've actually I've got a great recording coming up this afternoon. It's it's the guy who deals with embezzlement and he focuses with dentistry, but I know it impacts all of us. And so he started actually talking about situations in his field uh, with some colleagues and he's done some things to try third party payers and so forth, but he has a, a fairly big practice down here in Southwest Florida. And uh, he's, he's, he said, I'm constantly thinking about it. So I think it just, it's relevant across all uh, businesses really, but especially in medical and dental, when you're taking those payments as he is as an ophthalmologist, it's not primarily insurance based to the same extent. So he's taking a lot of payments for procedure, certain laser procedures and so forth that he's doing in office. Um, it, it's, it, it applies to a lot of different, a lot of different sectors. So everybody's got a story. <laughs> yes. I mean, when, when, when I run into somebody wherever and they learn what I do, you know, the first thing they want to do is tell me about something that happened to them or their, the guy they share an office with or their cousin or whatever. And there's, there's always a story. Yep. Yeah. You, um, your, your job must never get old. Seriously. No. And it, 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 embezzlement is, is almost as old as history. I mean, if you go back to the law code of the hammer rabbi, you know, this was the eye for the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth mm-hmm. law code. Embezzlement yeah. was covered there. Wow. There was a, there was a specific provision about embezzlement. So <laughs> this is, you know, back in 1000 BC or something. Oh my gosh. That's that's fascinating. Um, yeah, and I think as it, we'll talk a lot more about this, but it, it it's so emotional. It, it it hits on so many aspects of our senses, and um, there's just so many things. It's just so profound in, in how and how vast it can be, and in the vulnerabilities. You know, once you have it, when you hear that story, it's hard not to look at your own vulnerabilities and susceptibilities. And and that's really what I want to do today. And why I'm so excited to have you on is just to get people thinking about the things they may not even be thinking about. Um, We have docs of all age that consume this content. Uh, I do have a lot, meaning that I teach in a residency and uh, have contact with with a bunch of of young young docs and residents. Um, I will hear them and and they just, you just don't know what you don't know a lot of times on this, I think is a big part of it. It's true. And just a note to the audience, you know, if you have Ativan in your house, you know, you may want to have them nearby as we get into this. <laughs> yeah, uh, understood. Um, so before we do dive into the content, uh, take a moment, explain, and you have a fascinating background, um, a lot of degrees, a lot of letters after your name in terms of, of uh, what you've accomplished, you've achieved a ton. Um, and uh, I think you might win the award and you're amongst a lot of people who have a lot of the letters after their name. So you're, you're really, uh, it's, it's amazing what you've accomplished and, and even things that are, I just find cool, like being a private investigator and forensic accounting. So tell me a little bit about how, how you got down this path and, and got to where we are today. Well, a, a lot of that stuff came after I was uh, well down this path, as you say. 
Um, I was somebody who got in some trouble in high school, um, fell in with the wrong people. Uh, pretty quickly, the cops were showing up pretty regularly at my house. Um, my parents were despairing, you know, about the, the future of their son. And eventually I got put in front of a judge and he, um, let's say, strongly encouraged me to join the army as a, a, a better option to jail. Hmm. Um, and I guess what I had at that point was the ability to think like a karma. Okay. Um, you know, and when I, when I look at what differentiates me, for example, from a lot of other people who do some kind of forensic investigation, it's the ability to put myself in the shoes of the criminal hmm. and say, if I were in this situation, this is how I would steal. Interesting. Okay. You know, it's that, it's that hypothesis construction that really, um, is, is important. And certainly when we hire investigators, that's the biggest thing we look for. You know, can they, can they replicate the thought process of a criminal? If they can't, it doesn't matter what qualifications they have. They're, they're useless to us. So I, I, I had that early on. Hmm. Um, I joined the army. I really prospered there, like to everybody's surprise, including mine. I did well. I got promoted quickly. I was quickly put in a place where I was supposed to have a college degree that I didn't. Um, in fact, I also didn't have a high school diploma because I got an early eviction notice from high school. Wow. Um, anyway, the Army was nice enough to send me to college, and the university was nice enough to ignore the fact that I didn't have uh, the prerequisites <laughs> that they were looking for. That's great. So my, my education journey started then. Um, beyond that, I, I was always pretty good at uh, sitting for exams. And I became a CPA mostly because I, you know, not, not because I knew a whole lot about accounting, but just because I could do well on the exam. Mm. Um, but I, I, when my army time was up, I went to work for a bank. I didn't last very long. They, uh, the bank I worked for just insisted on making the same mistakes over and over again. And I was an investigator and I was flagging some of the weaknesses in their controls and they, they just had no interest in fixing them. Mm. So eventually I said, this is kind of silly. And I, I quit the bank. This was 1989, just to give you the, the, oh, wow. okay. the, the chronology. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quit the bank. Um, I was sitting at home bored uh, because this was the middle of summer. There was no such thing as a PVR or Netflix. So, <laughs> you know, you, there's nothing on TV. Yep. And uh, my phone rang and it was a guy I had known from high school in my, in my brief visit there who because uh, I, I made it partway through my sophomore year, Okay. who was now a dentist. And he said to me, I think my front desk person is stealing from me. And David, I have no one else to call. Ah, interesting. Okay. So timing was, was uh, serendipitous. I, as I say, I was bored silly. And you know, Isn't it funny how these things happen in life that way? I mean, it's just unbelievable. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, and the coincidences aren't over in this story either. Um, so, bored, silly, anxious for a diversion, and I said to my friend, "No problem. I'll I'll come over to your practice tonight after you close, and we'll get to the bottom of it." Mm -hmm. So I went to his office, and uh, this was back in the days before practices computerized. So they used this old system called Pegboard. Yep. And Pegboard was a a, a purely manual system, and what the each patient's balance was tracked on this thing called a ledger card. So each, each individual patient had a card with how much they owed. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, what my friend did is he shoved a bunch of these ledger cards at me. And I said, no, let's, let's try a little different approach here. Show me where she works. So he took me over to the suspect's workspace and I started going through her desk. Mm -hmm. And my, my friend was just about to you know, cough up a golf ball. I mean, he, he didn't think I could do this. Huh. And I had to explain to him, well, it's not actually her desk. It's your desk. She just sits there. Mm -hmm. So you That's own it. Interesting. Right. Yeah. 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 So I started going through her desk and Michael, what I, what I found taped to the bottom of one of her drawers was what we call in the trade, her cheat book. So people who are adulterating the accounts of your practice, because that's typically the format that embezzlement takes, they need to keep track of what's real and what's fiction yep. so that they don't by, by mistake send a patient a, an, an invoice or a, you know, a monthly statement with the wrong amount. Got it. Okay. Yep. 
Okay, so they have to keep track of it. Now you're more likely to see an Excel spreadsheet or you know, sometimes they'll code patients a certain way in your practice management software, you know, like put an asterisk at the end of patients where, you know, the, the, the record isn't right or something like that. Yep. Um, but in those days, it was an old fashioned high school notebook. Wow. So I found that and then the whole thing unraveled pretty quickly. There was uh, about $35,000 taken there, which was big dollars in 1989. Oh, I mean, yeah. today it, it would barely uh, make it onto our radar. And, you know, my friend was not happy that he'd been stolen from, but he was glad that I had confirmed it and kind of solved the crime. Mm -hmm. So he, he hit me up for one more favor. He, he asked me if I'd come back the next morning because he was going to fire this woman and he kind of wanted some company. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, <laughs> I knew I'd be bored tomorrow morning too. So <laughs> I said, no problem. Uh, I'll, I'll come over. So I did. You know, it was all done in about 10 minutes. And um, my friend shook my hand and thanked me profusely and promised to buy me dinner that has mm -hmm. never happened. Mm -hmm. uh -oh. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I walked away and thought, you know, that was interesting, but I didn't really see a career for myself. Okay. So two weeks later, lightning struck. And what happened was I had an appointment at my own dentist's office and I got there. And I was about to go in the door and I looked through the glass panel in the door and sitting at his front desk was the same woman I fired two weeks ago. No way. Yes way. And uh, what I said was <laughs> not, not repeatable. Yeah. Uh, I sprinted to a payphone, you know, because in 1989, a cell phone was like the size of a briefcase. Yeah. So you just didn't carry one around. So I, I, I sprinted to a payphone. And now I'm going to thank your part of the, the dental profession, because I didn't know a whole lot about how dental practices worked. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to get past the gatekeeper and talk to the dentist. So I, I knew the name of an orthodontist in my town. Okay. And what I did was when I called, I said, it's Dr. Jensen calling for, and I gave the name of my dentist and I got put right through to him. Yeah, you know, fortunately, great. there was no such thing as call display then. So that's great. Um, and then my my doctor picked up the phone and I said, "It's not Doctor Jensen. It's David Harris. I'm the guy who's supposed to be in your chair right now. But let me tell you why I'm not." And I told him about the time bomb ticking away at his front desk. Wow! And the guy panicked and hired me, and that was my first client. Wow. My goodness, is I mean, I, honestly, sometimes I think in life we're just destined for certain certain outcomes and people ask me sometimes when they hear that we are dentistry only well, why did you choose dentistry yeah and my answer is no i didn't it chose me kind of chose you yeah right yeah. right i yeah. i was just there at, the, at, at that specific place so by the time i finished work for my dentist the local rep from henry shine realized what i was doing yep and he had two other people who had embezzlement concerns and that was it i, That's I, I was in business and haven't really looked backward in 34 years. Wow. And, and then when, how did you, you just eventually were just kind of doing your own thing and then just decided to start Prosperident? Yeah, we didn't even have a name then. I okay. mean, it was, it was just me. Um, what, what really revolutionized what I do is the ability to move data across the internet. I mean, when I first started doing this, the, the way it would work typically is the doctor would meet me at six o'clock at night and hand me the keys to the office. Got it. Okay. Tell me what time the next morning I had to be gone. Mm hmm um, so that, um, you know, so, so that I was gone before the staff were, um, we used to have to carry one of those old Polaroid cameras. Remember the camera? Oh, sure. Spit out the, the yeah. picture. Yeah. Shake um, it. because, yeah. you know, if you were going through somebody's desk or something like that, you had to take a picture first Yep. and then you toss the desk so that you could put everything back where it was. Yep. Right. The, the photograph was your reference for kind of getting everything back in the right place. Yes. So, you know, the work was on site. It was always at night. I mean, you know, I was I was like a cave dweller who who never saw daylight. Wow. Um, and and was was just on my own. But once practice is computerized, and then once uh, once office computers hooked up to the internet, now suddenly we have the possibility of doing this at a distance hmm. and doing it during business hours instead of you know the graveyard shift. Yeah. Yeah. Do Do you so feel that's, like it, that's really where we grew? Do you feel like it? Um, from your experiences, was it easier? Was it easier to embezzle and or easier to catch an embezzler before we made the switch to computers? Did it just happen and people didn't know it because 
unless you found that book or saw it and now there's digital fingerprints that can be traced uh, or is it both now easier to do because of digital but yes also easier to it, it, trace it is way easier to do now okay um for a couple of reasons you know the first thing is that um the the, the financial existence of a practice has gotten a lot more complicated you know okay. when i started most dentists didn't even take credit cards you could basically pay them in two ways cash or check mm -hmm. Now, when you think about how the typical practitioner gets their money, you know, it's cash, check, credit card, care credit, EFT, mm -hmm. um, virtual credit cards that insurance companies use. You know, there are lots of different ways to pay. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one factor. The second factor is that most dentists who use the old pegboard system mm -hmm. could kind of navigate their way through it because it was pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, with computerization, a lot of them are are a lot more removed from the information. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yep. Than they were. Um, and then every time there's a technological innovation, that becomes the embezzler's friend. Okay. Um, you know, electronic funds transfers are a great example. Um, and our our recommendation to practitioners, and orthodontics are a little bit different, but if 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 I were talking to a general dental audience here, I would say don't don't get paid, don't allow insurance companies to pay you by EFT. And I do actually have a good number of, of uh, general practitioners and pediatric dentists, especially that listen, so yeah. Okay, good Good to know. Well then guys I'm, and gals, I'm talking to you. Um, the, the problem with electronic funds transfers is that the staff who are posting payments are now posting blind. In other words, if I'm posting payments and I get a check and I see the check and I post the payment and then the check goes in for deposit, Okay, I, I know the check went into the account. Mm -hmm. With EFTs, because most staff don't have access to bank accounts, and I don't think they should, I'm not advocating that as the solution. Mm -hmm. They don't actually know whether money went into the doctor's account or not. Mm -hmm. And we've seen several cases over the years where an insurance company was paying the wrong practice. Wow. So let's say you practice with somebody else, you know, you share offices, but you have separate practices. Uh -huh. You know, it's not uncommon for an insurance company to be paying the wrong doctor. And the That's problem is nobody realizes this. Wow. You know, the staff are just posting everything again blindly because they're they're working from EOBs, but they have no idea whether money is going into the account. Right. So, you know, we, we we would encourage doctors to unplug from electronic funds transfers and just get, you know, get 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 checks sent to them. Interesting. Um, and I think on this starting kind of the description of embezzlement. I think when people think about embezzlement, they often think about big hits, right? Like, oh, you know, it's because what you see on the news, it's what's sensationalized, what might be on social media. This person took a quarter of a million dollars and they see him going out in cuffs, which that's a big part of it, obviously. Uh, but talk a little bit about the fact that that's typically, or not, I shouldn't say typically, that's up to you to decide, but uh, it, it's not always the case for sure. Um, and is it, and how it does usually maybe start? Uh, would start small and grows, uh, or and um, is it also something that is happening way more than what we're just hearing about when we hear those big stories? I don't think people have any idea how prevalent this really is. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just doing a, a survey now. There have been several studies done over the years. The American Dental Association has done a number of them. They haven't they haven't studied embezzlement in about five years. Okay. So we're doing our own study right now, uh, simply because it's, you know, we, we need to see what's happening in the post COVID era. Sure. Um, that, that study will be carried on all this month. So we're, we're, we're canvassing, oh gosh, um, like 50,000 dentists roughly Wow. on embezzlement. What we've seen so far is that 70% of the respondents say, yes, they've been stolen from. 70% that, that know percent. that they've been stolen from, that are yes. aware of it. Oh my yes. Gosh. And some of the other 30%, I think is you're, you're intimating, may have also been stolen from and just didn't realize it. Exactly, but yeah. This is not a problem that touches some small corner of the profession somewhere. You know, the majority of the people listening to this will get hit at some point in their careers. Now, it, maybe it's minuscule. You know, maybe staff members are taking home toilet paper from the restroom because they, you know, they're too lazy to buy it or something, you know, pens or something like that. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's more than a million dollars. Um, and to answer your question about progression, yeah, a lot of embezzlement starts very small. It might even start, Michael, by accident. In other words, somebody might do a series of transactions that results in 
kind of money left over. Mm -hmm. And maybe they didn't even plan that. And they kind of sit there and wait to see if somebody asks for it back. Mm -hmm. And when that doesn't happen, now they do it again intentionally. Yep. But a lot of, in a lot of practices, embezzlement starts out really small. And as people get emboldened over time and as they kind of um, find the doctor's pain point for this, mm-hmm. you know, you'll, you'll see a climb. And I'll, I'll, in a lot of practices, embezzlement plateaus, it's somewhere between 2 and 4% of collections. So that's uh, a big number. So, yeah, you know, if your practice is collecting $100,000 a month, it's quite possible that somebody's taking, you know, several thousand dollars home. And, you know, 2% of collections doesn't sound like a big number, but the the thing about that is when you look at dental practice economics and the, and the the average practice has overhead of close to 70%. Yep. So the 2% of a hundred is is really really like 6% of of what you take home. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And for a lot of dentists, that's the difference between, you know, being able to pay the bills and, and provide for their retirement or just kind of scraping by each month and, you know, kind of, uh, having to watch the bank account carefully to make sure they have enough for the payroll. Yeah. I mean, just like in the number you gave hundred thousand dollars, if it's say 3% and it's three grand, it's not net. Like that's a great point. It's not 3000 of hundred at that point, because it's coming out of your take home. If it's 70% overhead, it's 3% or it's 3000 of 30. So it's technically yeah. 10%, 10%, 10% your yeah. your money is walking out the door without you even knowing it. And that, and you said that's an average that kind of a general yeah, that's, that's that's the norm you know that once wow. it matures and so, sometimes it gets caught long before it gets to that stage wow. but you know if somebody has been stealing for five years and they've been getting away with it yeah and it, ordinarily we would expect them to be taking between two and four percent of collections does it typically do people get i don't know if this is the right word re-embezzled i mean did do people are there re, are there offices or doctors who tend to be um easy prey or do people t- do you find they tend to learn from it and put the appropriate systems in place to mitigate that going forward sadly i think a lot of people learn the wrong lessons um and i mentioned the survey that we're doing and and one of the questions that we're asking people you know and so the first question is have you been embezzled from yes or no mm-hmm. and if you say yes then the second question we ask is how many times Okay. And the options are once, twice, three times, or four or more times. Twenty mm-hmm. percent of our respondents have been embezzled at least four times. What? Twenty yeah. percent at least four times. Yes. Oh, that they know um, about. Again, that they know about. Yeah, yeah. that they know about because that's wow. you know that that's that's appended after every answer and when when you talk about embezzlement. So wow, um, that's fascinating. Yeah, and and. I don't know necessarily that those doctors are embezzlement magnets. In other words, I, you know, I tend to think that there's some segment of the population that, that given a chance will steal. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the number of staff that the average practitioner will have over their career, you know, it might be a hundred or 120. um, And the chances are pretty good that you're going to get some rotten apples in that barrel somewhere. Do you actually on that, do you find that um, larger staffs, larger teams uh, have greater incidence of embezzlement, or is that small staff, small team where you've got just one up front, one in the back, but the one up front and one in the back, they do everything and you just kind of de- hyper delegate and there's no one cross checking their work. Um, you know, I- interesting question. And um, we, we work with four of the 10 biggest DSOs in the U S wow. and they all get stolen from with a fair amount of regularity. Uh, more supply um, stuff or are we talking even the cat the, no the no side? i'm talking financial embezzlement you okay. know money money going out the front the, the front door okay um the the thing about embezzlement in general is that i think what really drives the probability and the occurrences is you have i i, I described a, a, a time bomb a while ago you have a time bomb in your practice mm-hmm. so you've hired somebody because dishonesty is in all of us I mean, I can construct a set of circumstances where anybody would break the rules. Mm-hmm. And I have people who come to me and say, you know, I, I would never under any circumstance, <laughs> uh, you know, there's, there's, there's no way I would steal. Okay. So let's pretend the power grid for North America went out and it's not coming back. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've got, you've got two uh, kids under 10 and they're both hungry. 
and there's a grocery store full of stuff down the street, you know, where the meat's about to spoil and whatever, you know, would you break in to feed your kids and realistic, you know, if somebody's realistic, they say, yes, of course I would. So there's some level of pressure that will make everybody turn dishonest. Yep. And statistically, this is kind of a random walk, you know, so, so you have a practice and you have 15 employees and really what drives whether embezzlement is going to happen or not is does one of those employees get pushed into a place where they decide that stealing is their best way out. And it doesn't have a whole lot to do with you. Interesting. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you're an orthodontist or, or, or a prosthodontist, it doesn't matter whether you're urban or rural or big staff or small staff. It's just when you have that person okay. who, um, who wakes up one morning and says, yeah, today's the day I'm going to steal. Um, that's when it happens. And the, the real question is how long they get away with it. And that's where practices that have good control systems will shine because they can catch this person fairly quickly, typically not instantly, but you know, before it, before it turns into a five or six figure activity mm -hmm. and the practices with weaker control systems, well, you know, they're the ones where we, uh, you know, we hand them a report at the end with a lot of zeros after yeah, and and actually on that, uh, we kind of get into the systems a little bit. <clears throat> Start to talk a little bit about some of those top systems. Let me give you a few that you find that um, just ones that are just the the nothing's going to be perfect. But what systems do you find are the most effective at warding off and minimizing the risk that someone will be embezzled? The the winning answer here is hiring proper. Um, most dentists are incredibly casual about pre-employment screening. And probably worse now because of the employment environment. And, I mean, and it's so when hard. it's hard to find people, your temptation, it, and, and I understand that when it's hard to find people, you, sh you may need to cut your standards. Mm -hmm. um, what I always tell dentists is that's fine, but you need to know by how much. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and I'll give your audience a really sobering statistic. 70 million Americans, which is one in four adults, has a criminal record. And yet, probably less than 10% of dental practices do criminal records checks as part of their pre-employment screening. Wow. Um, another one that astounds me, since I'm, I'm on my soapbox about yeah, this, yeah, please, is drug testing. The norm in dentistry is we don't drug test people who are applying for jobs here. Mm -hmm. Why the heck not? Mm -hmm. I mean... It, you know, it, or as an orthodontist, you probably have maybe even never prescribed a controlled substance in your life. Right. Um, but you could. And certainly if I if I had a drug problem, I can't think of anywhere I'd rather work than a perio practice or an OMS practice where, mm -hmm. you know, prescriptions fly out of there like like candy leaves my house at Halloween. Yeah. So it just amazes me that this profession that holds the keys to the pharmacy. Mm -hmm doesn't drug test applicants. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, very important is talking to former employers. Bearing in mind, Michael, that the applicant may not want you to do that. Yeah, and I know there's some legal sides. Uh, my wife would answer this a lot better than I would as she handled that that side of the front end of the practice. But um, especially in New York, there were a lot of there was a, there were a lot of laws in place that limited how much we could ask, how much employers and employers just didn't want to tell us anything because I think they were afraid they previous employers they were afraid they were going to have legal action against them. So in New York, at least, we could literally only ask if they had been working there, if they had rehired them. There were some very very vague questions that we could yeah. ask. And and you know what that that very vague question you just asked is perfect as far as I'm concerned. That's the only question. Okay, is this person eligible for rehire at your practice? Mm -hmm. That, that's the only that's the only thing I want an answer to. Okay, great. Um, for two reasons. First of all, because anything other than an emphatic yes means no. Okay. In other words, if I ask you that question about a former employee, and there's kind of three seconds of silence, mm -hmm. and I, like, well, I'm I not sense the best one to answer that. <laughs> you're, you're, you're kind of composing your thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Before you open your mouth, you've given me the answer. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that most employers, most former employers, will see that as a safe question to answer. 
And they did. And they did it. We, yeah. yeah, that's a great point is that was one thing. And again, my wife did a lot of the research into what we could and couldn't say and how to formulate those questions. But it, if they got back to us, which that was another challenge is we, you know, we'd call three, four times trying and couldn't always get someone to reply. But yeah. when we did, that was a, an answer or a, a very telling answer that we found. So it's very interesting to hear you say that, that as well. And, and when somebody won't reply or won't answer, there's a very easy way to deal with it. What's that? So this is typically somebody who's scared of being sued. Okay. And just like they teach you in martial arts, use somebody's weight against them. Mm -hmm. So what you the, the next message you leave when somebody won't get back to you is, uh, you understand that this person may be denied employment with us because you're not responding to our questions. Mm, I love it. Nice. In yeah. other words, you know, give them the mental picture that maybe this employee will sue them. Right. Because they wouldn't answer the questions. That's a great pearl. That's outstanding. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a way you can deal with that. Yeah, that's that's great. Anything else in the interview process? Um, you mentioned the background test, the drug test, the checking the references, anything that you could ask or should here's, ask all applicants? Yeah, here's a really basic thing that that most dentists haven't uh, haven't latched on to. Uh, when I'm interviewing you for a job, mm -hmm. one of the things I should do, and you, you need to do this at the interview, is say to you, um, Michael, I just need to verify your identity. And can you please give me your driver's license and two pieces of secondary identification? Okay. And the secondary could be anything, you know, a, a gym membership, a library card, student card, credit card with their name on it. I mean, it doesn't matter. Just two more things with their name on it. But do that at the interview. At the interview, not at the hiring. This is at the interview. Not at the hiring. Mm -hmm. one, okay. of the, one of the truisms here is that background checking in general is meaningless unless you do it on the right person. <laughs> yep. So if if uh, I have some baggage in my life and I have a brother who's a year younger than I am who is clean, then it's the easiest thing in the world for me to show up and pretend to be my brother. Yeah. And if you are casual about this, um, I get away with it. Yeah. Now, if you hire somebody, there's that I-9 form that has to be done that requires verification, right. yep. but it's, it's one piece of ID. Mm -hmm. And if I get hired, I know that's coming and I'll have the fake ID you know, with my brother's name on it when when I'm asked that question. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not prepared to be ID'd at the interview. Mm -hmm. And even people who have fake ID normally won't pay the money to get fake secondary stuff like the gym membership I mentioned or the mm -hmm. library card. You know, they'll have a fake driver's license, but that's it. Yep. So you ask them for three pieces of ID and it's like, uh, you know, well, I didn't bring it. Okay, so let me see if I understand this. You drove 12 miles here today. You don't have your driver's license. And you don't have a credit card. So, you know, if your car breaks down mm -hmm. and you need to get a tow, you really have no way of doing it. And I'm starting to question your judgment. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the other hiring tip. Let's let's pin down the identity of this person right away at the beginning. Um, the other thing I'll say about hiring, too, just mm -hmm. while I'm on that subject is yes, when you post a job, be upfront about the screening that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to drug test, tell people that. Mm -hmm. If you're going to do a criminal records check, tell people that. Right. Minimize your workload to find people that yeah. would have just not even applied. What you don't want to do is go through the whole process of hiring, which is time intensive and mm -hmm. takes mental energy. Yes. And you get to the end and you find that right candidate and you say, yeah, you're exactly the one. <laughs> and, but... Now, we just need to do the criminal records check. And they say, I'm out of here. Right. Um you know, the whole the whole point is exactly what you say. Let's let's have the unsuitable self separate before they kind of get into our process. Yeah, we did. And I think, you know, it's funny. It's such a great point. And so many docs do that in other ways. Like we, we did it and, and developed this process over time when it came to our values, our core values. Our, we, we were very upfront about what we expected, punctual and, and all of the things we expected because we wanted to turn away those people who were like, well, I really don't want to. We had the hours listed that they had to be at work. We put all that in the ad, which got a lot easier once it went up from a little paper snip, which I'm old enough to have started practicing when that was it. You put it in the newspaper and every line, you know, the, the cost went up a lot. Now it's online. So it's totally different. Um, so you can really put a nice, nice layout. So it's really from what you're saying, there's no real reason not to put that in um, to that ad to, to just add in that it involves drug testing and background criminal history check. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's hiring. Um, yeah. In terms of other systems, one of the big things I emphasize is doctor involvement in practice management software. And I'll, and I'll be fairly specific about what I mean in a second. Mm -hmm. 
So when you think about your software, it records really three things. The first is what you charge and what you do clinically. Mm -hmm. The second is adjustments. And the third thing is collections. Mm -hmm. And one of the one of the basic simple concepts in a practice is that the amount of money collected should equal the amount of money deposited in the bank. Mm -hmm. So in, in theory, that's very simple. In practice, it's a little bit daunting. Mm -hmm. Um, what I see probably 70% of doctors pay no attention to that whatsoever. In other words, they do not enforce collections versus deposits. Really? That percentage? It's high. And wow. if that's the case, if I want to steal from a doctor who doesn't know how much money should be going into the bank, yeah. it's so easy. I don't, yeah. I don't need to do anything creative. I don't need to cook the books in the practice management software. If I can just peel away some of the deposit, and put it in my account. So that can, tends to be the lowest hanging fruit for an embezzler, mm -hmm. typically. Yeah, that the dumbest, laziest embezzler on the planet can steal from you if that's your your system or lack thereof. Right, right. Um, the other thing I'll say to the audience is, I hear this a lot, um, in, including as recently as an hour ago, a doctor called me with embezzlement concerns, and just about the second thing he said to me was, "Well, I don't take in much cash." I was going to ask you about what, that. Yeah. What, what was in his mind was that the only thing somebody could steal was $20 bills. Right. And I said to him, and I'm not going to go into details here about how, mm -hmm. but I said to him, it is easy for somebody to cash your checks. It is not hard at all for somebody to intercept credit card payments that are supposed to go to you. Mm -hmm. And even electronic funds transfers can be hijacked if somebody knows a little bit about how the system works. Yep. So let's, let's broaden our horizon beyond green cash and think that any form of incoming money can be stolen. The example from the ophthalmologist this morning from me. So here's a second example was was actually checks. Um, it was the example yeah. that that he gave me, and again, won't elaborate on what he said was being done. But he but it was a, a colleague of his, and it, and it was checks that was that was happening. A lot of dentists think that a check with their name on it is inviolable, and it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, we see pretty much every day we see checks cashed by people whose name is not on the front. Um, so. You know, we can't we can't just say I don't take in any cash, so I'm not vulnerable. You, you are. So is it just the reporting of the transactions that that the doctors need to be cognizant of? Is it? I mean, I think practice management software for I was always kind of techy and geeky that way, and I love to learn how the software worked. And my wife I was very fortunate; was very good at building reports and doing a lot. So we and love spreadsheets. So we kind of did a lot of that. Um, I know a lot of docs that I teach and, and colleagues are just, they don't want to deal with it. They, they just don't. It's nothing they find any enjoyment yeah. in. So, you know, that software is more important to your financial well-being than your handpiece. Hmm. Yeah. That's and, important to people to hear. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every general dentist knows that handpiece like it's their child. Mm -hmm. And it comes to practice management software and I'm like, oh, I might break something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I know a lot um, of people that are like that. Yeah. And you know, whether, whether it's the way you want the world to be or not is irrelevant. <laughs> um, very, very true. You know, sticking your head in the sand doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be any better when you pull it back out. Yep. Um, so let's, let's accept that, you know, part of the responsibility of being a practice owner is that you need to uh, have some oversight over the revenue of your practice. And if you don't want that as a doctor, if you say, no, you know, that's not, that's not what I signed up for. Fine. Go work for, uh, you know, join the military, uh, you know, work for Indian health, FQHC, uh, mm -hmm. DSO, you know, they're, they're go teach at university. There, there are lots of outlets for people who say that's not for me. Yep. But if you want to be a practice owner, then with the privileges of ownership come responsibilities. And this is one. So, your oversight challenge here, I can break into a couple of parts. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, did the software capture transactions correctly initially? So at the end of each day, you need to review your day end report. And I'm going to add one more thing that some people won't like to hear. Okay. And for goodness sakes, print it yourself. Okay. Do not allow anybody to hand you a report that you rely on because you had no control over the parameters used to generate that report. Okay. And selective reporting is alive and well in embezzlement. Okay. So print the report yourself and look at it and ask yourself some questions like, does it make sense? You know, it, it is for, for my own columns, is what I'm seeing consistent with what I remember happened today? Mm -hmm. 
um, for if I, if, if I'm in general practice and I have hygienists, um, you know, does their stuff make sense? In other words, if my policy on radiography is that every patient gets annual bite wings and they get a panoramic every five years, you know, if a hygienist saw 12 patients today, there should be around six bite wings mm -hmm. and there should be one or two panoramics. Mm -hmm. Um, so don't try to follow the money on a daily basis. Just ask yourself, does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, let's do the money on a monthly basis. And there are two parts to it. The first part is articulation. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, of course, every dentist has a, you know, a picture of a, a, a mandible on a max law. Right. Um, and I, I'm boring that term from dentistry very deliberately. The articulation I'm talking about, call it financial articulation, if you want, works like this. Mm -hmm. Let's say your practice was open 15 days this month. And in your left hand, you've got 15 individual day in reports. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones you printed yourself, remember? Yep. And in your right hand, you've got one month end report. Mm -hmm. The total for fees, adjustments, and payments for the 15 That's should good. be exactly the same as for the, the, the month end report. Mm -hmm. If they're not, Michael, somebody came in on a weekend or after mm -hmm. hours and they did stuff they didn't want you to see. Mm -hmm. Which is so common that teams are there when doctors aren't in dentistry. Which is right? so common. So, so common. that's the way of enforcing that you've seen every single transaction. Mm -hmm. You know, that your your day end reviews were complete. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for financial articulation is step one. And step two is the, do the collections equal the deposits? When you do that monthly, mm -hmm. first of all, it's easier to do something once than 15 times. Mm -hmm. Secondly, what confounds the, the the comparison of those two is timing differences. So if you picture a patient who, who pays by credit card today, mm -hmm. your practice management software will treat that as a, as a collection today, today but right. the money probably won't hit your bank account for a couple of days. Two days yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you, in, in, when you look at a day, it, it's entirely possible that 80% of your transactions, maybe even more, have some kind of time offset. Mm -hmm. yep. As your horizon gets bigger, most of those self-resolve. Yep. In other words, if you look at a month at a time, the patient who was in on the 15th and paid by credit card and the money went into the account on the 17th, that's not a timing difference anymore. Right. Um, when you deal with a month, the only stuff you're chasing is the, the transactions where one leg of them overhangs the beginning of the month and, or, or, you know, one part of it overhangs the end of the month. Mm -hmm. Which is easy so to the, just go look at those days, particular days. And just, if there's, a yeah. Problem. And, and, and there's one, you can do that. There's one easier thing you can do. It's a, um, plot the variance. In other okay. words, look at the difference between collections and deposits, and there's mm -hmm. always going to be a difference, mm -hmm. and stick it on a graph, and then track a, a, a six-month running total. Mm -hmm. If what you're seeing is timing, then you know when you when you plot a line of the of the running total, it'll be fairly straight. Six, settle out, yeah, yeah, because your timing difference in one direction this month becomes a timing difference Time. of the opposite direction next month, right? So if you if you plot those, you you kind of get something that looks roughly like a sine wave. Um, on the other hand, if if you plot that line and it's sloping upward, in other words, the cumulative difference between collections and mm -hmm. deposits is growing. That's not timing. Yep. Yep. That's now it's something that. else, and that's where investigation makes sense. Yeah, and a lot of software programs now you can even you can plot that within the program too. So you probably can. I you know I I just typically build an Excel spreadsheet that okay. will that will do it, and you know Excel has a nice function that will plot a straight line to a bunch of points. Mm -hmm. So it gives you a good chance to look at the slope of the line and see whether it's it's zero or, or or sloping upward. And you can just for docs who are thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to hand plot. You're just exporting the what is it, the CSV file or whatever it is and importing it into Excel and then just running it from there. So it's not like it's a lot of heavy lifting of data crunching. No, it really isn't. Um, so in in terms of controls, those are the those are the three best I can give you. You know the um, the the hiring carefully, of course, and then. And then the stuff you do at the end of each day and the end of each month. Now, one thing I did, um, and I did it I, from the very beginning when I started in practice, I started my own practice almost 20 years ago, had, it was right on kind of the cusp of things going digital. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't think I even really had an email at that point. It was, we were just, I was always that class that seemed to be the next year was going to start digital when I was in school. I was always like the last paper class at every stage of my schooling. Um, so the good of that was when I got to my residency, we kind of were a class that that had to learn both. And, and so I learned the systems that were used in paper, which can be valuable. And then I had to learn how to actually implement it 
implement the technology, which helped me a lot in building and setting up my practice as a digital practice. One thing I did from the beginning before I had any money coming in was I hired an independent bookkeeper. I hired somebody through a reference. It was uh, someone who knew and I did, did the appropriate checks on her. Um, she had done, was a bookkeeper for multiple other businesses that I talked to. And she would come in and I set it up so that she did not communicate with my staff. She had no access to my practice management software. Conversely, my staff had no access to my QuickBooks. Um, those passwords were separate from one another. And um, not that I set them up for an adversarial relationship, but I let it be known to both of them that the other one was there to catch them doing something wrong. <laughs> and I, in a subtle way, you know, I, I didn't like, like, oh my God, you know, you don't want to talk to Kelly because, but I would just say like, oh, Kelly's sharp. And if she catches something, you're going to have to answer to her. And, and to Kelly, I would say, you know, it's, if you talk to the team, you know, they're going to try this and that. So it, I, I, I wasn't, I was trying to manipulate them because I wasn't making things up. I was telling them the truth. Like this is, this person's here to keep check keep tabs and and checks and balances on you. Is that a good thing? I mean, I just did it kind of because I just wanted someone outside the office to, to not be, I didn't want, I just never felt like I should have someone who was in my practice management software in my QuickBooks. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but I just wanted to throw that out there as a, um, way to do it. I, I, I'd be okay. I, I mean, yes, what you, what you said, I agree with. Um, although the, the stuff I just talked about, like the articulation and the comparison of collections versus deposits mm -hmm. um you know that stuff does not require dds or dmd after your name to do it's mm -hmm. a it's a very mechanical exercise mm -hmm. so if you wanted to take this one step further i still wouldn't give the bookkeeper access to the practice management software but what you might do is print off the daily and the monthly reports and give them to that bookkeeper and yes, say okay what, do, yes that's exactly do the did. articulation yeah. calculation yeah. for me and make sure that the the, the the daily and the monthly line up yep and, and i would check the final line item and do the deposits yeah. myself and, was how and, I and then also that. verify the deposits versus collection i mean to me that would be a that would be a decent separation of functions mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. That tends to be, that's basically exactly the way, the way that we approach it. And I know no system is bulletproof, but um, I think as, as you were alluding to, it's about minimizing how easy it is for somebody to either stumble upon a way <laughs> to succeed at this or be able to outsmart you and think, well, that's not a really hard thing for me to beat when I, when I need to, when I'm tight financially and, and, you know, look, doc's got all this money and all this and all this money's coming in. What's the big deal. And do you find that there's a lot of that? I mean, is it a lot of like, he's, they've got so much, what's the big deal. Is that the rationalization a lot of times? Um, there, there are a lot of different rationalizations possible, but the, you know, she will never miss it is certainly one. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. there are a lot of other ones, you know, I, my, my value to the practice exceeds what I'm, what I'm paid. You know, it's uh, yes. called the metaphor of the ledger. <laughs> yep, yep. Yep. Um, Say that again. Yeah. I'm sorry. What was that called? I, I was laughing. The metaphor of the ledger. Metaphor of the ledger. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, there are there are a lot of rationalizations people will throw out. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the some of the thieves even, and this is you know a, a, a fair number of embezzlers are, are sociopathic. Mm -hmm. um, some of the sociopaths will even construct things like, you know, I'm I'm protecting the patients from the doctor by stealing from them. <laughs> which is, is a huge stretch, but I've, I've heard that uh, more than once. Oh my gosh. That's uh, um, wow. Just uh, let's, let's, uh, let's talk to the orthodontists in your audience for just a minute, because okay. there's one Achilles heel in ortho. Yeah. Um, that's relatively easy to close. And, you know, when we think about orthodontics, the way that a patient enters your financial system is there's a, there, there's a new patient start and there's uh, a contract entered into your practice management software. Yep. Somebody else needs to oversee the entering of contracts. In other words, in most practices, this is done by a financial coordinator. Correct. Mm -hmm. And in most practices, it is completely unsupervised. Okay. So, Michael, what could possibly go wrong with that? Um, oh, well, and, I could think of a few things. Yeah. Yeah, I could too. So, um, you know, if it's if it's a, a small enough practice, the doctor really should oversee that. I mean, you know, unless you're starting 400 patients a month. Mm -hmm. Um, this is not an onerous task, right? You know, in a, in a typical practice that might start 20 or 25 or 30 patients in a month, it doesn't take that much time to make sure that those contracts were entered correctly. Do you have a quick strategy for what oh, an easy way to do it? Cause there might be people who just don't even know what the contracts are. Like, is there a quick yeah. way they could um, do that? I mean, every, every ortho software will, will print a report of new contracts entered this month. Okay. 
Um, so you can get it all on one page basically mm -hmm. and just check it, you know, and if, if the, the fee for Invisalign in your practice is 5,500 and you see somebody entered at 3,500 and you mm -hmm. don't know why, I mean, they're not your brother-in-law, um, that, that needs to be, uh, considered to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the, 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 the good and the bad of ortho, when I compare how embezzlement happens in ortho practices versus yeah. how it happens in general practices is, you know, the number of what I think of as revenue events in an ortho practice are really small. Hmm. Um, in a general practice, I mean, you might have a dentist who's seeing 20-ish patients a day and they've got two hygienists who see 12 each and each of those patients creates a revenue event. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in ortho, as I say, if you do, if you do 25 starts this month, those are your revenue events. Mm -hmm. So it's it's easy for the doctor to take a look at them. Okay. So every contract needs to be reviewed and 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 checked off. Now, you know, if you've got a big practice and you don't you don't um see the need to do this yourself, well, second best is uh somebody other than the financial coordinator needs to check. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fr from the discount standpoint, is that a place that people get into trouble where they'll they'll add in a discount, they'll make it one of your codes in your software? Um, and is it is having coding is coding being? I guess let me back up from that a second. Should the doctor be the one in the beginning and the practice manager that sets very specific codes for what is applicable for a discount and knows those codes? So if they look at a report and it doesn't line up with a code they built and have, then they should they should be wary of that. Absolutely. I mean, when you when you think about the number of reasons why somebody would get a discount, and this is true whether we're talking about an ortho practice or a or or any other practice, mm -hmm. the number of reasons why somebody gets a discount are pretty small. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think at the most you would have eight or ten types of discount code. Agreed. Yep. Um, at most. So yeah. At most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things you need. First of all, your software needs to have those set up as individual codes mm -hmm. what's a really bad idea is to have this thing called miscellaneous adjustment and it just gets used for everything you know whether it's it's so um, common i know so many practices yeah, that do that i mean yeah. you're, you're you're treating the the child of one of your referral sources or you know it's it's a it's a ppo where there's a negotiated price i mean mm -hmm. in in a lot of practices i see those two coded the same and a couple of things happen there. First of all, you lose valuable management information. If, yes. if you're yeah. if you're in the PPO world, one of the decisions you have to constantly reevaluate is, you know, should I go out of network with some of these insurance right. companies? And the only way you can decide that is to know how much you're giving them back in adjustments. Yep. So, you know, if 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 you're a general dentist and you're in network with five different insurance companies, you need five different codes. Mm -hmm. You know, P PPO Delta, PPO Humana, PPO Cigna, whatever, mm -hmm. so that you can you can decide whether you know what the financial impact would be if you went out of network with with one of those insurance companies. Yep. But yeah, there should be a, a, a small number of, of adjustment codes, and if something really does go into that miscellaneous code because there's it doesn't just doesn't fit any of the other codes you have, mm -hmm. then the requirement should be the staff member needs to enter a narrative. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now they need to say what happened and why the patient's getting a discount. Mm -hmm. Unless you review this stuff and unless you actively probe a bit, uh, of course, all this is pointless. Right. In other words, if you right. if if you tell staff to do something but you're not enforcing it, yep, or checking it, um, right? Yeah, then yep. that's pointless. But yes, adjustment codes need to be pretty specific, and that's a that's somewhat of a disincentive for somebody to try to bury stuff in adjustment codes. I mean, mm -hmm. when you when you think about what an embezzler is trying to do in an ortho practice basically what they want is the patient to pay more than the software expects them to pay okay. right that's the golden moment mm -hmm. so if i if 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 a patient is going to pay six thousand dollars for their aligners and i can make it so that the practice management software is only expecting five thousand that makes a thousand steal mm -hmm. yep now as you discussed at the beginning we're not going to talk about how they get there but that's that's the goal of the thief. Yep. Um, and in ortho too, you have a moment of truth that you don't have in a general dental or a perio practice because you, you have debonding. Mm -hmm. And in other words, your job as an orthodontist with each patient is to work yourself out of a job. 
Mm. Right. <laughs> um, your, your, your job as a general dentist is to never work yourself out of a job with a right. patient. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's a moment when, and most orthodontists will take a look at the patient's balance at debonding and make sure that it's where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On that moment of truth side, just want to touch a little bit on, um, how that all ha how, how, how's the shakedown happen? I mean, it's, a uh, it's a highly emotionally charged situation on all sides. So a doc uncovers something, they think, um, something is going on as your friend did back in the eighties and, uh, to get you started down this path. And, and, and that's often probably how it still happens. I would imagine is that you get a call and you just say, I, I just, something's not right here. You guys go in, you do your amazing work. Your team does your amazing forensic work, um, to uncover something's going on and you, figure out something is going on. Take a moment, if you would, to just kind of go through what that looks like. Because I think a lot of people are almost scared of the unknown. Like it's almost like if it's a little bit, I just don't even want to know or care because the pain of figuring it out and it is probably so great. They almost convince themselves. They almost rationalize like, okay, I can't lose him or her from my practice or it's so little, but without them, I, you know, I'm sure there's a ton of reasons. But the, the metaphor of the ledger again, but on the other side. Exactly. Perfectly said. So it kind of take me through what that looks like on, from your end. Okay. And, and I want to issue a big caution first mm -hmm. because um, a lot of dentists live in the world of the quick fix. Mm -hmm. If you're a general dentist and you're doing a hygiene check and you, there's a, there's a patient in a hygiene chair and you can see the caries there. What goes through most general dentists mind at that moment is uh, do I have a column open where I could fix that today? Right. Yep. Okay. That's the, that's the mentality. I see caries and I want it dealt with now. Mm -hmm. um, and that serves you really well in a clinical sense. And it leads you to some really bad decisions in this area. Okay. So I had a call a few months ago and it was from an orthodontist and she um, suspected embezzlement. She, she called me on a, on a Friday mm -hmm. and she said, all right, I, you know, I, I became suspicious yesterday. So Last night, I went into the office and I changed all of the software permissions so that, you know, I'm trying to stop her from doing what she's been doing. <laughs> uh, okay. Yep. And I said to this woman, okay, bad news for you. Um, here's how you're going to spend the rest of your Friday. You're going to get back in your car. You're going to go back to the practice and you're going to put everything back to change where it was before. Mm -hmm. um, if you suspect, no matter how strong the urge is, don't start changing stuff. Mm -hmm. We do not want to let a suspect know that they're a suspect yep. because if I've been stealing from you and I think I'm about to get caught and I think the consequence of that is that I'll go to jail, the list of things that I will refuse to do to prevent all that from happening is pretty short. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had a call with a dentist going back years. Um, you know, he suspected embezzlement in his practice. I think I quoted him a fee of $6,000 for us to investigate it. Mm -hmm. And he decided, you know, if I made it through dental school, I can do my own investigation and save $6,000. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what he did next, Michael, but he, he tipped her off. And her response was to come back that night with a can of gasoline and burn down his practice. Stop it. Yeah. Now, she went to jail. I mean, she was caught on camera with the, the drugstore across the street, caught her on the camera. Oh. So she went to jail for arson and, and probably served more time than she would for embezzlement. Mm -hmm. um, but imagine the the financial oh. kick in the gonads this gave him. That's um, brutal. You know that probably cost him eighty or ninety thousand dollars in downtime, and you know all of the. I mean, sure he had insurance, but that doesn't cover oh, his at time. At least, oh, it, it just and just the, yeah. the time and energy and resources. And, oh. and you know his his kind of rueful comment to me after was that was a little bit of a false economy, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, it, if you suspect. Um, the key is not to telegraph your suspicions. Okay. The second key is you need help and you need it now. And please don't make the mistake that I see a lot of us making in life where we confuse somebody who knows 20% more than we do with an expert. Mm -hmm. yep. people, will go to, people will go to their CPA or their software trainer yep. or their practice management consultant for advice next. Yep. And those are not experts in this field. My my financial consultant, who I did one episode with recently, and another one's going to be coming up. He calls it the the brother in law investor. 
<laughs> yeah, everybody yeah. says, "Oh, my my friend, my brother in law, he told me this tip." You know, that's that's kind of the same sort of uh, situation. That's exactly it. I mean, you know, when you when you look on um, dental Facebook forums, you know, I'll see somebody say, "I think I'm being embezzled. What should I do?" And twenty dentists will chime in with things they think are helpful and are just dead wrong. Yep. Yep. You know, call the police. Well, my my question when somebody says call the police is, "What are you going to tell them exactly?" Right. When they ask you, well, how much money is stolen? Hmm, don't know yet. Not sure. Right. When did it start? Not sure. Not sure. You know, mm -hmm. is it just cash or is it checks or credit card? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And after about the third question, the police are going to say, actually, it's not our job to tell you what was stolen from you. You right. have to figure that out. When you do, come back and see us. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you'll you'll see 20 people say, call the police, go to your lawyer. Well, this isn't a matter your lawyer can actually help you with. Okay. Um, if, if this goes anywhere, your lawyer will be given to you by the, by the state. Uh, in other words, the district attorney will be your lawyer. Interesting. Okay. So, you know, let's, again, there are lots of people who are experts in other fields. There are relatively few who know about this one. Mm -hmm. Um, but to answer your question about what we do, the, the first touchstone that we have is that embezzlement investigation needs to be secret. So, you know, when I when I tell you not to alarm the suspect, mm -hmm. I follow the same rules. One of the one of the big things that we do is that we will actually build a duplicate of your software mm -hmm. and do the investigation in the duplicate. Okay. So if you're using, you know, let's pick a software. If you if if you're using OrthoTrack, yep. We will actually we will get remote access to your server, copy the OrthoTrack data files mm -hmm. to our server, and then we build. In our computer lab, we build a clone of your ortho track Neat. and we do the investigation there. So that keeps that firewall between us and your team. You know, if we if we kept logging in remotely to your software, they're going to notice. Yeah. When we create our own copy that they don't know exists, we can poke and prod at that to to our heart's content mm -hmm. undetectably. Yep. This the second advantage to doing that is it gives us the luxury of working with static data. Oh, interesting. Uh, right. Because every challenge minute of, of every summer, day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And an investigation will usually take eight to 10 weeks. Okay. I was going to ask that. So um, like if we're doing that of, in of live just software, you guys doing your work in the background, that's before any yeah. additional steps. Okay. Exactly. So if we were doing that in live software, one of the things we have to contend with is the amount that, of stuff that's going to change over that time. Sure. And the analogy that most of your audience can probably relate to is it's like having a really squirmy kid in your chair. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the copy that we make will never be changed again. Right. That's great. So it's, it's, it's very stable for us. So we, yep. we start there and then we, we compare collections against deposits because as, as I mentioned, that's a, a really common methodology, especially if it's not watched. Okay. And then we also look for deceptive transactions that are designed to make your software lie about how much money came in. Okay. Now, are you looking at bank records at this point as well, or are you not there yet? We, we, we compare your software to the bank, to your merchant accounts. In other words, the, the credit card terminal you have at the front desk. Okay. Um, if there's patient financing or payment management involved, you know, care credit, ortho fi, mm -hmm. anything like that, we yep. will, we will do that comparison as well. Mm -hmm. And then we look for stuff that would allow your day in to balance while money is still being stolen. In other words, make your software lie about collections. Okay. Um, so that's the, that's the final place we go. Okay. And then from there, what, what does that look like when you, I actually have a quick question. Does it ever come back clean? I mean, <laughs> do you, it, when, does. it does. Okay. Um, okay. and to, you know, first of all, people come to us for different reasons. Okay. Um, some, you know, some people have caught embezzlement and they now need us to map it for them. Mm -hmm. Some have suspicions and they want to know if the, if the suspicions are, valid or not. Mm -hmm. And some people come to us prophylactically. Yep. They they say to us, you know, I really, I, I don't have any particular reason to think I'm being stolen from. Okay. But I see the statistics and I don't want to be the the gal who's asleep at the switch. Yep. So, you know, we have people who are expecting to find nothing and 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 often do and they're happy about that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um we also Great have time. people sometimes who swear on a stack of Bibles that they're being stolen from and in fact they're not. Okay. And you know, they're, they're, they're misreading something where there's a factor they didn't consider. Okay. I mean, I had one guy who swore he was being embezzled because 
there was a significant difference between his collections according to his software and his um, deposits. Mm -hmm. And what we what we found most of the time when when patients pay by credit card, the way the credit card companies treat that is they deposit the payment intact. And then at the end of the month, they debit you for their fees. The fees, right. This credit card company wasn't doing that. If a patient paid $1,000, what would go into your account would be, say, 970. So they took their fee off every single transaction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and it caused it, it caused a mismatch between collections and deposits. Sure. Yep. Um, you know, which which the doctor quickly interpreted as embezzlement. And I mean, very happy client when we said, mm, you know, it's something else. You you don't have to fire, you know, Sally, who's worked for you for 18 years. It's right. You know, you might want to fire your credit card company. Yeah. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's there's something benign that gets read wrong. And then if it's not, what uh, what is that? What's the next step in the process? Well, the, ne the next steps are getting your money back, first of all, and secondly, um, trying to, to do what you can to protect the profession. Mm -hmm. So getting your money back in involves a couple of things. First of all, every dentist has insurance for employee dishonesty. Mm -hmm. yep. What most dentists have is $25,000 of coverage, mm -hmm. which is kind of a drop in the bucket. I mean, the average case we see is about $100,000. Okay, And that's just, the case. that's just what you see. That's not even like a national average. That's just just from your data. Yeah, they're probably not that different. I mean, we're the okay. we're we're by far the biggest company in this. I mean, we're we're bigger than all of our competitors combined. Okay, by a factor of about three. So what we yeah. see probably approximates the the, okay. the the national average. But twenty five thousand of insurance isn't really going to cover what most dentists will expect to lose from this. So mm -hmm. another takeaway is to talk to your insurance company about what it would cost to bump that up to a bigger number. Okay. And in a lot of practices, you can move that up to seventy-five thousand dollars in coverage for maybe twenty-five or fifty dollars a month. Okay, All right, that's great. Too. Which, personally, I, you know, knowing the statistics, I think is is money pretty well invested. Mm -hmm. um, but you you start by making an insurance claim. That's the first way you get money back. Okay. The second way you get money back is situation specific. In other words, it it applies in some cases and not in others. But if somebody's been cashing your checks at their bank their bank is actually on the hook for that. So, you know, if, if uh, you deal at, uh, at, at Bank of America and somebody's taking your checks and cashing them at Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo has to make good on that. And yeah. the, the nice thing about that, if, if you have to be stolen from, that's the way to have it happen. Because whether or not the thief can pay you back, Wells Fargo certainly can. Yep. And then the third source of recovery is from the thief. And that's that one's... Um, a little harder and often the way you get paid back is kind of protracted. In other words, you might, the wages might be garnished after they get out of jail and they're paying you $600 a month. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can, that can take a lot longer to, to get back to you. And then you guys um, handle the litigation of that at that point as well. Once the discovery has been completed. Once we're done, um, normally the next stop is the police station. Okay. And you make that stop with our report and our, when embezzlement's found our, our reports typically run 60 to 80 pages and we we write them in a way that somebody who has no knowledge of dentistry can see what happened okay great yep because that's where they're going next to, sure. a, to yeah. a detective in a police department typically yep. so the next stop is the police department in some jurisdictions you can skip over the police and go right to the district attorney okay and if that's possible in your jurisdiction it's a really good idea because it will make this all happen much faster mm -hmm. um also if you're claiming on your insurance the insurance requires you to report it to police that's not elective okay. with them um and that's that's a standard insurance requirement i mean if your car was stolen you'd have to do the same thing sure. um so police first then insurance um in in terms of the justice system uh you don't have to fund it and you don't have to really manage it in other words, once this goes to police and assuming they have fairly complete information and our job is to give them that, mm -hmm. once they have fairly complete information at that point, they should be more or less autonomous with it. Okay. And the, the legal work is done by the district attorney or in some cases, if a, a lot of embezzlement also involves committing a federal crime. So the U.S. attorney might be the, might be the, the, the lead on it, okay. um, but they're funded by the state. You know, your your involvement is probably limited to spending a couple of hours on the witness stand testifying about what happened. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to pay an attorney. You don't have to 
Um, you don't have to kind of manage the process. It it all happens by the government, just like any other crime. I mean, if you're, um, you know, if if you're a victim of armed robbery, you don't have to hire an attorney to put the person in jail. The the, the state does that for you. And is this the same thing if you let's say because we've been talking about there's multiple forms of embezzlement if you know that someone is stealing supplies or skimming supplies is this this would it, is it a similar type of process obviously you wouldn't be needing to recover the server maybe yeah maybe the it, image it, the uh, inventory software but but does that look similar if that's what's happening it, it, it depends um so supplies are a bit of a challenge and what happens quickly is that we run into a limitation that we can't transcend but the police can okay. so if if, if we thought that somebody's stealing supplies, you know, the real question is, how are they monetizing? It? Okay. And, and typically what they do is they sell the stuff on Amazon or maybe Craigslist or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and the way to crack that crime is to get a subpoena and force Amazon or Craigslist to turn over their, their vendor records. Okay. Uh, in other words, in general, when you buy something on Amazon, you don't know the name of the seller. You know, it's all kind of anonymous. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, we can we can find what we think it is on Amazon, but then we end up going to the police and saying, you know, here's here's why we believe a crime is committed. Can you please get Amazon to disgorge its records to you okay. about this particular seller? And then, you know, you can find whether they live in the same city, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you you can get their name and and email address and stuff like that and you see if it matches up with a staff member. Mm -hmm. OK. Or, you know, can we connect the two? In other words, somebody might steal and they might give it to their brother-in-law on a fence for them. Mm -hmm. I was actually going to ask you, what if they're pawning it off to uh, someone else and then, okay. Yeah. I mean, t typically we can we can link the two of them somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is, and that com is it the, common? Is it is it common, the supplies side of things? Um, yeah, it is. Um, it, less common than monetary theft. Okay. Because it's more work. I mean, you know, now physical, right. you have to physically yeah. remove something visible from. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing we will typically do in that case is, is get the police to get a search warrant on the person's house because, okay. you know, the other thing that happens when somebody's stealing supplies is there's some time interval between when they steal it and when they monetize it. Yep. And this stuff is sitting somewhere. Okay. So it's at their house or maybe they've got a storage locker and it, and it sits there, you know, cause they don't want it home, but when you when you start searching their spaces, you you often can find you know those missing rotary endo bits. And is is it one of the things you recommend as a safeguard to have cameras on site in your practice? I, I do, but you know there are a couple of concerns with cameras. The the first is I've been doing this for thirty four years, and the number of embezzlers I've seen caught on camera is less than ten. Really. Um, interesting. Yeah, let, I wouldn't have guessed do a that. Little bit of, really interesting. Let's, let's do a little bit of math here. So, you know, you have a practice and it's open 32 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And you have two cameras covering the front desk. Mm -hmm. So each week you're shooting 64 hours of video on your front desk cameras. Mm -hmm. When are you going to watch it? Right. That's a fair question. Cameras are great for when the time of an event can be pinpointed. Right. Um, you know, there's been some theft at front desks. So, you know, somebody comes like a lab courier comes into your, your practice Yep. and they find, you know, the front desk is deserted, which happens sometimes. Yep. And they see a nice Apple computer monitor there and they just pick it up and walk out with it. Yep. Um, and if that happens, you know, you can, you can narrow down the time when that monitor disappeared pretty quickly. Cause as soon as your front desk person comes back out of the restroom, they're going to notice their monitor gone. So, yeah. you know, you know, it happened within the last 15 minutes you can go to the camera footage and see who came in. Yep. And oftentimes what was always my biggest challenge was we only stored the data. I mean, the data, you can only store it for so long. I mean, it's so, <laughs> it is so much volume of data and it's so large that to have the storage capacity, even offsite remote cloud, it fills up. It, it absolutely does. And the other issue too is, um, you know, most cameras won't really capture what's on a computer screen accurately. Mm -hmm. True. Yep. Um, so, you know, if you, if you saw somebody putting money in their bra, you might, you know, you might, uh, find that noteworthy, but typically when you put cameras in the laws require you to notify people. In other words, hidden cameras, mm -hmm. cameras yep. hidden from your staff may not be legal in your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you are doing that, yes, please do talk to your attorney. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they they may not even be legal. So 
typically you have to notify people that you have cameras in place. And I guess the staff for the most part knows where they are. Yeah. So they're going to adapt. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And okay. you know, if I'm going to steal money, I'm going to walk out of the, of the view of the camera with a file folder under my arm mm -hmm. and you know, inside are a, a, a bunch of legitimate things and the money I'm going to steal. Mm -hmm. And then I do that. I do the transferring outside of the view of the camera. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I, I think they serve some purposes. Like again, the lab courier, you know, certainly I, I see some value in operatory cameras because, mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, if, if something goes wrong, like let's say that, for example, a, a patient claims that the doctor uh, loaded them up on nitrous and then groped them. Mm -hmm. Cameras are perfect. I mean, if you have, you, you got to think about operatory camera placement pretty carefully. Yep. But if you have, if you have the camera, then you can show that no, you know, my hands never went below the bib. Yep. Um, so they have some value. The other, the other challenge with cameras is that recording video and recording audio in most states are subject to different laws. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's very difficult to record audio in, in a lot of jurisdictions. So mm -hmm. what you end up doing with the cameras is turning the audio off. So you're yep. capturing video only and no audio. Exactly. Yep. Which is fine for the did he or did he not grope the patient question. Um, but a lot of embezzlement, you know, when you're looking at video only and you have the audio context deleted, it makes it a lot harder to resolve what really happened. In other words, if, if, I, if I'm looking for embezzlement, what I really want is that I want to hear the conversation between the patient and the staff member. Mm -hmm. Yep where the patient the staff member says to the patient you know i'm sorry mrs smith but the the laser printer is broken today and if it's okay with you i'm just going to give you a handwritten receipt okay that's the you know that's yep. the yep. holy that's, crap uh -huh, yep. mm -hmm. conversation that i want to hear yep and in most states i probably can't yep okay great i appreciate you going into that well i mean you've provided so much this has been great I mean, i've enjoyed it thoroughly just learning and hearing it from an expert like yourself i mean it's uh you know, part of it gives that little pit in your stomach where you're thinking of all the, the vulnerabilities uh, that you or colleagues have. At the same time, it's it's so necessary for us to listen to this, hear this, what you and your team do. For anybody who wants to hear more too, um, David's got on his website some great webinars they did. I think a lot of it was post-COVID and even beyond. And um, just talking about this, hearing some of the stories uh, that I enjoyed just kind of in, in prepping for this, listening to and, and hearing about what is really going on out there. We, we can tend to, as you said, we can tend to be naive and bury our heads in the sand and not want to face this, but boy, are we better facing it. So, number one, proactively. And number two, if you do think that you have this problem, call <laughs> David's firm. I have no financial connection to him at all, um, but I just you know love good businesses and people that are out there helping the profession and doing things for the better, whether that be uh, something clinical or administrative, uh, something like this. It's just the, the services that you and your team offer and valuable. And the other thing, listening to some of those webinars, just how sharp some of the people are not sharp, all the people that were on the, the podcast or the webinars, which are some of the people that work for you uh, are really just, just, just whizzes at this. It's clear they're they're experts in and what they're doing and and um the uh, you know i think the thing that also comes through we talk about this in this format and the the the, per, the victim uh is not here so uh when you listen to some of those stories of the victims it, it, there's a lot of emotion in this this goes well a lot of a lot of psychological damage um shame embarrassment frustration these people some of them you know these people were were, were dear friends of their family for decades uh people they knew well and you hear this it, it it's it's profound and so what you guys do um i knew what you all did is important obviously but when you hear Doc's talking about that you stopped this from happening to them um, you know, and their retirement savings and had to work extra years. It's it really awesome. It's awesome what you guys do. And I give you a lot of credit. You're obviously all very passionate about it and very good at it. So thank you for what you all do. Well, thank you. And certainly if people are going to check out our webinars, there's one I'll mention for your ortho audience, but also for everybody else. Um, and I can put a link up to it too. I'll do put your website yeah, and, and that webinar. Yeah. Perfect. Which one? Um, there's a, there's a webinar that where we interviewed an orthodontist named Dr. David Hughes from Virginia. I, I, that's one of the ones um, I watched. Yeah. You watched that. Okay. Yeah. So David lost $380,000 to his longtime office manager. And he, mm -hmm. he was very candid and very vulnerable about mm -hmm. what happened to him and what he learned from it. And, um, I think if you, if you want to, um, watch a an, an episode and see somebody you can identify with i mean david's a, a very smart guy mm -hmm. yep. um and you know and and not a business 
ignoramus either. I mean, he, you know, he, he thought he was paying attention to the right things. He thought he was doing the right job and she still took him for, for a massive amount of money. So if, if you want one that is somewhat entertaining, but also, um, so you know, let's, <laughs> yeah, lets you think there, but for the grace of God, go, I, um, yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd highly recommend that episode. Yeah, I'll put a link to that up for sure, as well as to your website. And I'll put a link to your book um, as well. But uh, no, it's awesome. You guys do so so much good for so many. And and on Dr. Hughes, his humility and just his, I, I don't know if I could be as composed and calm <laughs> as he was. I mean, uh, and, and he was saying, and at that, I mean, it's still going, it was a couple of a few years ago, it's still going on. I think they had just, it was time of the webinar, they had just found something else that, that, that was uncovered. I mean, it's like never ending. Yeah, she got sentenced a little while ago, and um, Wendy Wendy Askins, who's our, our head orthodontic investigator, who was mm-hmm. um, the investigator for David Hughes, and she was there at the sentencing. And, um, yeah, you know, it was it was vindication for all. But yeah, that's a that's a really good episode, and 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 yeah, he you know he's a he's a remarkable man, and uh, I'm I'm so privileged to know him, and. Uh, you know, if I if I lived in Virginia and my kids needed braces, I mean, he would be <laughs> he would be my guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's an impressive guy um, and can't help but just feel for him and feel that we're all very susceptible to this. So um, no matter what 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 we think otherwise, it's that's a reality. So, well, thank you so much for your time, for being here, for taking the time to explain this and for what you do for the profession. It was a great conversation. My my pleasure to have the chance to talk with you. Awesome. Thanks so much. We'll We'll talk soon. All right. See you, Michael. All right. Bye. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to ADA SERP recognized CE courses or to schedule a private one-on-one coaching session with me. And remember to join the Doc community on Facebook for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Facebook, search for the Doc community, and request admission into the group. You can also find Doc on Instagram at at the ortho coach. And always remember, you have been blessed with the ability to do amazing things.